Hi, oh, I'm Misha here, and I have another British bomber for you. This is the Vickers Wellington, and this is, as with most British models, a 172 scale die cast made by Corgi, makers of all things British, I suppose. And this is actually a very interesting aircraft with kind of a long storied history. And I apologize for not having it on the spinny thing. Um, this is very heavy. And you see it kind of sits on the stand at an interesting angle. And I just wasn't sure on the spinny thing about balance. I didn't want it to go thump. So we'll have to make do. This is the most produced British bomber of World War II, by actually a quite a large margin. It was the only British bomber to be made all the way through World War II. And it was the primary bomber of Britain when the war began, and for the first couple of years of the war. So, you know, you think of the larger bombers like the Lancaster or even the Sterling, they're big four-engine heavy bombers. But early on, this carried the brunt. And this is a two-engine, as you see, and it is considered a medium bomber. And it dates back well before World War II. In 1932, the Air Ministry wanted a new, modern, two-engine, long-ranged, medium bomber. Basically, they wanted something that outperformed anything that existed up to that point. And Vickers was invited to submit a design. And in 1933, they submitted two possibilities. And... Later that year, the powers that be selected one. And they would continue to work on it. Vickers had some ideas and changes. The Air Ministry agreed. They worked on it through 1934. In 1935, the specifications were kind of... Um, Increased, they kind of increased the size, weight, and capabilities that they wanted, so there had to be some redesigning. And uh, the prototype of this first flew in June of 1936. Also in 1936, Bomber Command was established because of the uh, growing Nazi threat in Europe. So, the prototype would fly, of course they would make changes, it, it went well, but one of the late changes they added to the specifications is they wanted three turrets. And throughout 1937, the design was continually improved and updated. And in late 1937, the first production craft rolled off the assembly line and was tested. And by this point, Vickers had christened us the Wellington. And it would first enter squadron service. The, the first ones would be delivered in October of 1938. And this is really when things ramp up. Initially, the RAF only ordered 180. But then the political situation continued to go south. You had the Munich crisis. So this order was quickly increased. And we go from there. 
So what kind of plane do we have here? Well, we're a little under 65 feet tip to tip. We have an 86 foot wingspan. Originally, this would have two Pegasus engines. Later, they would use Merlins. Then they would use Hercules. So a few different engines were used over the years. The initial prototype would have a crew of four. Later, this would be upgraded to five. And even some versions of the Wellington would have a crew of six, just depending on needs. Initially, we would have two turrets. We would have the front and the rear, and initially they would just have one 303 caliber machine gun each. Then when the Air Ministry decided they wanted three turrets, they would add a third ventral turret that was retractable on the underside. This had a bomb load of 4,500 pounds. It could carry nine 250 pound or 500 pound bombs. Here is the plug in bomb bay for the model. You can see what that looks like. Just goes along most, most of the bottom. Quite a large bomb bay considering the overall size of the plane. And probably the most interesting feature of this plane for its day and time was its so called geodetic construction fuselage. This was designed kind of like some airships had been done at the time where basically a lattice work, a basket weave as I've read it called, of struts spars were put together and this was done to provide strength and rigidity where basically each half kind of supported itself. Then this was overlaid it was basically made of wood and metal overlaid with fabric, canvas. And this really had some advantages in the sense that it was very strong and allowed the fuselage to have many holes in it, even big gaps, and still maintain structural stability, integrity. But it did complicate manufacturing and it made the plane hard to adapt and scale. You know, once you had the the kind of diagonal weave put together, it was hard to extend or reduce the fuselage, which is something they ran into when they went to the larger version of this later on called the work. But either way, it was an interesting thing, and it's kind of a, at the time, a unique design, but it also shows that this was still made with a lot of wood and uh, fabric, which of course later on we'll see all metal planes. So this would eventually kind of make it a bit dated. Well... Early versions of this could get up to about 235 miles per hour. Later versions with better uprated engines could get up to about 250. It could climb up to an altitude of about 18,000 feet. And it was designed to be a long range bomber, so it actually could fly from England and hit targets in Europe, so that was one benefit to it. This wasn't the only two-engine bomber that the RAF had in the late 30s, but it was the one that was most successful and the one that saw the frontline service. When World War II kicked off, this actually made up the force that had the first bombing raid that Britain launched in 
1939, September 4th. And it really kind of took the fight to the Germans when and where it could. They initially used these as daytime bombers, but heavy losses were experienced. And so by late 1939, early 1940, they had pretty much switched to nighttime bombing. One big problem, the original ventral turret, the retractable one, was not terribly useful. They, they Luckily they had upgraded the rear turret and the front turret to at least two machine guns, so the front coverage for the size was okay. They would go to waist guns on each side instead of the bottom turret to try to improve the situation and give better side coverage. But even after this, they found that the Wellington never really had great coverage. At least it had blind spots. It had uh, gaps in its defense that German fighters quickly learned to exploit. And the good thing about its construction was, like I said, it could take a great deal of pounding. You can even see in the model kind of the lattice work, how the uh, geodesic was made. But this old wood metal fabric construction was quickly becoming dated. It could burn, obviously. This also did not have self-sealing fuel tanks. Nevertheless, the Sterling was being delayed because of bombing raids, and the Lancaster had not even been developed yet. So this is what the RAF had, so it's what they went to war with. And in 1940, in August, the first bombing raid over Berlin at night was conducted with Wellingtons. And it continued to see heavy use throughout 1941. Luckily by 1942 finally the four engines were starting to come online. You had the Sterlings, you had the Halifax, and even some early Lanchesters. I always say that, I apologize, Lancasters. There's a Lanchester gun and it always... Yeah. <laughs> so these started to be pulled out of frontline bombing service in 1943 and in fact the last major bombing raid conducted with Wellingtons occurred in October of that year. But, these were also used for many other purposes. For example, uh, Coastal Command would use these as anti-submarine patrol planes. They would actually get their first naval vessel kill in June of 1942. They would use these as anti-mines. They would use this kind of magnetic, electromagnetic ring thing to set off the sensors the, on sea mines. They would fly over and do that. They would also use these as sea mine layers, so kind of the opposite. And they would even use these as uh, torpedo bombers. This could also be used and was used frequently as a transport for troops or VIPs. And even after they were taken out of frontline bomber service, they were still kept in frontline service for the naval duties as well as used as training. And they were even used to test some of the earliest jet engines in 1943 and 1944. So the Wellington was still very much important. In fact, these were still being made until October of 1945, at which time the last one rolled off the production line with nearly 11,500 made. And there, there were several marks and submarks and variations, and no reason to ramble into all that here and now. Mostly the changes had to do with the engines and sometimes the crew placements and a little bit to do with the armament. 
So it was a very widely produced and quite successful design considering that it really dated back to the early 1930s. Not many other planes were relevant this long. These would drop about 45,000 tons of ordnance onto Britain's enemies. But of course, several thousands were lost, either through direct in enemy engagement or other mishaps, you know, take off landings, war times. So many did not come home, but nevertheless it had a good record for what it was. In fact, the last Wellingtons didn't leave British government service, at least in one way or another. I'm just going to do that. Until 1953. Of course, by that point, they were very much second line training, patrol, kind of just auxiliary craft. But, you know, it was small enough and versatile enough that it had a purpose. And again, it's kind of mo the most iconic of the two-engine bombers used by the RAF during the war. And I just think the fuselage is neat, and that's why I picked up this Corgi model. It has an interesting texture. It's very heavy. It's all metal. If you notice, the um, the turrets are kind of recessed. They're kind of shielded inside the fuselage. They don't stick out a lot. This was done to try to reduce drag and help with the speed and all of that. Also, originally why the ventral turret was retractable. It's a traditional... One little landing gear in the back, and then you have the two up front. And as you saw, it has a, a bomb bay that run, runs the majority of the length of the fuselage. But yeah, I enjoy British planes, and I hope you do too. So I thought I would share this uh, Corgi Wellington. It kind of goes well with my uh, B-25 Mitchell from the USA. Anywho, if you have any questions or comments, please post them below. If you could, like, share, and subscribe. And also maybe check out some of my other videos in the Bomber Command playlist or elsewhere. I don't know. I have fun making these, so I hope you have fun watching them. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.